All right, well, thanks very much. So um, thanks to the organizers. Organizer, thank you. Um, I appreciate being in this particular spot because I think the stuff I'm going to talk about dovetails nicely into the last couple talks we heard. So what I want to talk about is using the local group um, as, as sort of a time machine to provide constraints on the early uh, universe that we might not be able to probe directly with searches. So uh, this talk is, you know, I see it in the context of a series of papers that have come out recently where people are trying to use uh, local group data to inform my ideas about what's going on in the past and specifically relying on some incredible uh, deep CMD work that's been done using HST to study the uh, star formation histories of local group galaxies. And the idea is that you use that information together with what we think we understand about structure formation to make connections about what's going on at the very high redshift universe and then on down. So today, um, in my talk, I'm going to focus mostly on sort of Z78 and talk about constraints I think that we have to impose on what's happening with the UV luminosity function at the very faint end uh, from the local group. And then Andrew Grouse is going to come right after me, right after the break, and look at stellar mass function constraints from Z of 2 to Z of 5 that I think are also pretty powerful, again, coming directly from the local group. Um, so I like to start off this talk with sort of this basic kind of tension between sort of conventional wisdom at the high redshift universe and the low redshift universe. Low, re low redshift universe, we have a very good understanding that uh, because galaxies like the Milky Way ought to be surrounded by thousands and thousands of potentially uh, star-forming halos, that star formation needs to be suppressed in these objects. So there are about 10 classical dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way with stellar masses above about 10 to the 5, while there are about 1,000 halos that should be in this volume that are above the atomic cooling limit. So we know that something must happen to sort of turn star formation off in a lot of these halos if this picture is going to work. The conventional wisdom at the high redshift universe is a, lot, is a lot different, right? Because at high Z, you know, we see that star formation is booming. And so there's this idea that star, you know, stars are forming rapidly in small halos at early times. And then at Z of zero, uh, the star formation we know is suppressed. So the question is, can we understand, can we learn things from this particular tension? Another, another bit of conventional wisdom is that, at least uh, if we ignore our, our previous talk, which I'll come back to in a second, um, there's this idea that galaxies are going to drive reionization. The QSO count perhaps is dropping off, and so we need galaxies to sort of pump out these ionizing photons to, to drive reionization. But what's interesting is sort of in sort of conventional models, and this is a slightly older one from Brandt, and he has a more updated one, and there are others of these in literature, the idea is that you have to extrapolate the UV luminosity function well past the limiting magnitude depth of surveys, and these luminosity functions are fairly steep, all the way down to luminosities of something like minus 11 or minus 10. So very faint luminosities to have enough ionizing photons to maintain reionization. So just to remind ourselves what we're talking about here, right, is this is, this is a, a compilation of data that's a little bit old now. But here's a redshift 8 luminosity function here uh, that's cutting off at sort of the blank fill limit from the UDF, from the HUDF. This is what we need to do to get to those luminosities that I was talking about uh, to maintain reionization. This is way, way down, right? So here, you know, we're at sort of the, the limit of the HUDF. If we push using the frontier fields and believe that we understand the lens models, we might be able to get here. Maybe JWST deep field, we'd get here. But we're still a very long way from probing directly these ideas for testing this kind of conventional idea. And even if we were to be crazy and do a JWST frontier field, that might get us here but we're still not at this point to kind of test this basic idea. So we need to appeal to some other method to try to sort of test these scenarios. Um, so that's where we have the local group coming to the rescue. So the local group is surrounded by you know, tens, perhaps of order 100, uh, little galaxies that are faint today. And we have uh, some excellent data from HST, again from HST, but using it in a different way that allow us to sort of probe down the the star formation histories of these things, that then we can ask what these objects were doing back at the epoch of reionization. So specifically, this is a, a compilation from Wise et al. that I'll be talking about. But there are these really nice star formation histories for most of the galaxies in the local group that we can use to inform our ideas about what these things should have been doing earlier on. 
And the data are pretty good back to sort of Redshift 5. Um, you can even push it back a little bit more before that if you think you have some idea about how bursty the star formation history should be. And that can provide a bit of an error bar on what you think the luminosities would have been at these early times. So here is a, a comp, sort of a summary uh, of where we think some of the local group galaxies should have been sitting. This time at Redshift 7. This was in a fairly recent paper by Bolin Kolchan et al. Uh, that's on the archive. What's shown here now is there are actually frontier field data on this point, uh, on this plot, uh, from ATEC, at least estimates from ATEC. But uh, you see it's getting down, here's sort of the blank field limit. It's not approaching what we think the progenitor of the LMC would have been doing. We think the Milky Way actually probably was sitting somewhere around here. The LMC, so the frontier fields, if we believe that magnification 10 detections are sort of detecting maybe uh, proto-LMCs. But if we wanted to get to the point where we're pushing down all the way uh, to study sort of luminosities that might be required to maintain reanimation, we're going all the way down here to sort of Leo A and Sculptor. So this is what we're talking about being potential primary drivers. So I'll just put up the plot that I had before. Here's a way to get to this sort of sweet spot. In principle, we can get there using these local galaxies. OK. Now, something to keep in mind as we look at this spot, though. Now, now, now take a look at the y-axis. The y-axis is the number density we're talking about here. This is a very high number density. You say the number density is about one per co-moving co megaparsec cubed. That's very high. So in physical units, right, that's 1,000 per cubic megaparsec. So think about what the local group was doing then. OK? It wasn't, you know, it was, we have some rough sense of how big it was. It was probably about 10 megaparsecs across at that time. So it should have been filled with things of that size at that time. So if objects of that number density are pumping out, are forming lots of stars, then what would they be doing today? So that's sort of the question. Is this reasonable that we actually have lots of galaxies at that number density forming those stars? Are there enough progenitors around today to make this possible? Well, that's why I'm going to have to use simulations. So we have some simulations to help us with that. So that's, that's where we're going to go. So this number density is indicative of 10 to the 8 solar mass halos. So if you just ask what kind of halos we're we talking about to get to those number densities, that's where we are. And that's not crazy because halos of that size in principle could be forming stars. Those are H1 cooling halos. They're actually above the nominal threshold where we think UV suppression ought to be knocking them out. So in principle, uh, you, should have, you can have star formation in these things and that wouldn't be a problem. You can go through the exercise of doing abundance matching to these UV luminosity functions. You get a line that looks sort of like this. And this is the UV suppression scale, nominal UV suppression scale halo mass. So if you're above this mass, there's nothing magic about UV suppression that's going to shut you down. So this is what we're talking about required to maintain reanimation. Here are some recent simulations that actually are, have been run at these high redshifts that, in fact, even sit on this extrapolation. OK. Now, but if you look at this and you, and you ask, what is the star formation rate at these UV luminosities, it's about 10 to the minus 3 or more solar masses per year. What that means is if these things form stars for 100 million years, they've already formed more than 100,000 stars. That might not sound like a lot of stars, except that in the local group, we have lots of galaxies that have that many stars, but we don't have that many galaxies that have that many stars. So you can ask, is this going to work? Like Abishai was hinting at, we can't just kind of make these you know, rough ideas about what number density should be. So we can use simulations to ask these questions. We can say, look, let's run simulations of the local group. We're going to use uh, Shea's Elvis simulations here and ask, what were the progenitors of bound clumps? So these are bound things that have not been destroyed. What were they doing at Redshift 8? What were their masses? How many were there? And remarkably, there are lots. So what's shown here is um, what's circled here are things at Z of 8 that are main progenitors of things that survive to Z of 0. So one-to-one -one relationship between 
objects that were above the atomic cooling limit at Z of 2 or Z of 8, here's where they end up at Z of 0. This is ignoring merging, which would increase the numbers. So what this says is there should be about 200 bound descendants of halos that were above the atomic cooling limit at Z of 8 throughout the local group. From, so from that, you see that there's some serious tension here, because there are not that many 10 to the 5 solar mass galaxies in the local group. So each of these, if this conventional wisdom holds, would hold, host more than 10 to the 5 solar masses of ancient stars now. It's not even total solar masses of stars, it's ancient stars today. In total, there are fewer than about 50 galaxies sort of in the classical scenario that I'm going to focus on, whereas the predicted count is way higher than this. So this says there's serious tension here. So there's something in this model that has to break. So if you think about what this really is, it's missing satellites in a time machine. Because it's just the missing satellites problem tracked back to early times. No, neither of these guys are here, so they kind of... <laughs> so here's just an example. If you take this kind of luminosity function and extrapolate it to Z of 8, and then do the mapping and ask, where should things end up in the local group today? Um, here's what you predict, the shaded band, and here's what's observed. So you get this massive uh, missing satellites problem, basically. The ancient missing satellites problem. But then if you do something, for example, like you break the luminosity function, then everything works. So what this suggests is you can't have these luminosity functions just rising forever like this, or else you would just really mess up our understanding of the local group. So the way to think about this, I think, is so here's where we are. If we're doing deep field science in the near field, as we get to sort of you know, where the frontier fields potentially will reach, we're looking at Milky Way M31 progenitors. If you go down to sort of minus 14, minus 13, those are the progenitors of classical Milky Way dwarf steroidals. And this would be too many. You just, there are no progenitors that would match this part of the luminosity function. So you have to sort of shift it over. Now, if this is true, if there is some kind of break like this, that's actually kind of interesting. Because you might actually be able to detect the sort of primary sources of UV photons from galaxies, at least, with some, you know, somehow maybe with, J, with JWST. So that would be kind of interesting. You might ask, what about reionization? So, you know, aren't, you know these, the numbers that went in, that go into these calculations are pretty uncertain, so maybe there's a factors of two or four uncertainty in this. You have very big escape fractions. The ratio between UV luminosity and ionizing photon count is different than what's assumed. So maybe you can push these things down. Or maybe this sort of emerging picture where QSOs are contributing uh, is, is really what's going on. So it could be some combination of this. Um, so why, you know, the other thing this requires, of course, though, is that the progenitors of these halos are not forming stars rapidly, and the question is why? What's the physics, so why doesn't this happen? There are a lot of different reasons why this might happen, of course. Um, it could be that, you know, just with stronger, earlier UV fields, you can push this threshold up a bit, and so maybe the effect of UV suppression is somewhat stronger than people had thought. And of course, we have H2 cooling, stellar feedback could be stronger. So all of these things could, in principle, contribute to the, you know, turning off galaxy formation, maybe making it less efficient in these halos. Interestingly, the stuff that Coral, the simulations that Coral is going to talk about in a little bit, if you actually look at what her systems are doing at Z of 8, they're actually pretty consistent with this kind of extrapolation. There's only a few and they turn into dwarfs, but they turn into dwarfs that aren't forming too many stars at Z of 8. So, you know, if you include, you know, in some models at least, this is not, this is not crazy. So, um, I'll put up my slump, uh, summary slide then. So I think the big takeaway message here actually is I have, I think, just sort of touched on potentially what you could do with these kind of comparisons between the local group and pushing out to higher Z. Um, you know, for example, you know, it allows, I've just talked about a way that you can use resolve star formation histories plus some understanding of what progenitors and descendants are doing to probe luminosities that are much deeper than even JWST will be able to probe 
and therefore test questions about the nature of reionization sources that you can't test in other ways. Um, for example, you know, I've talked about this kind of missing satellites in the time machine thing where it's hard to understand how the Z of 8 luminosity function can continue to rise as steeply as we're seeing all the way down to luminosities that might be required to maintain reionization. And then, in fact, it may have to break at something like minus 14 or something uh, in order for uh, local counts to be resolved or to be understood. Um, so, of course, then what you need to do is you have to shut off galaxy formation in these sort of halos that are well above the atomic cooling limit. I talked about different ways why, why that might happen fairly naturally. Um, and if this break does happen, then it's kind of nice if you think about what JWST will actually be able to directly detect. JWST could, in principle, then be directly detecting the sources, uh, at least the, the galaxy sources that are contributing primarily to the UV flux. So, okay, that's it. Thank you. Satellites, what do you think about a scenario where you have bursts of star formation and each burst, you know, puffs up the halo and the stellar system and get rid of some stars, eventually ending up with two days, including and then being more vulnerable to tidal stripping in, in the Milky Way halo? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, so there's one of the things I haven't really talked about is. You know, I've assumed that the in-body simulations are actually predicting the, we are actually be able to connect the descendants and progenitors in a one-to-one -one way. And that might break down, and it probably does break down the closer you get to the Milky Way disks because of the tidal disruption. And in addition, if you've got a lot of star formation going on, you puff these things out so they're more susceptible to tidal disruption, and that messes things up as well. I think that we need to figure that stuff out, and that's something we'll need to consider as we sort of try to refine these kind of constraints. One reason why I think that this at least qualitative result is pretty robust is that we see this effect out throughout the local group for things that, aren't, that haven't been accreted yet, um, where people don't typically see this kind of enhanced stuff just, just doesn't disappear because of feedback. It really only disappears after it gets sort of interacting in the virial radius. But I definitely agree, these are things that we have to think about, and just using in-body for this is not going to be enough to really take this to the next level and add precision to these kind of constraints. Uh, you could think of it as the IMF. Yeah, it's going to be hard. You'd have to, be, you'd have to do some extreme things to the INF to do this sort of order of magnitude issue that I've been talking about. But yes, that's going to, that would affect things a little bit for sure. Yeah. So can you go back to the plot you showed toward the beginning uh, with the star formation histories from the resolved stellar populations? Yeah, so I think this says something very interesting about the kind of quenching mechanisms you're allowed to invoke. And I was wondering if you could comment on that because it seems like, okay, so saying that, for example, the UV background heating is higher and so maybe you quench these things Maybe that sort of works for Sculptor, which looks like it formed all its stars, you know, 12 giga years ago. But it seems like a model like that, or a model where you say just eject all the gas early, runs into severe problems with the ones where the star formation history is extremely flat. I mean, like N205. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, you can't appeal. As you start approaching things to the luminosity of Sculptor, I mean, Sculptor is sort of on the edge of a classical. And certainly as you go to the ultrafaints, those things are uniformly old, and those things really do look like they were quenched by reionization. But as you start moving into sort of 10 to the 5 solar mass range, which is where I'm focusing on now, it's kind of why I'm doing it, you don't see this sort of characteristic early time period. So it looks like whatever's happening is happening globally. So I'm, I, I agree with you that I don't think that just appealing to the UV, you know, the magic of UV uh, uh, suppression is going gonna, is gonna to solve these problems in detail. Well, well, the feedback Right. There needs, this, there needs to be some star formation. Right. Now that's a lot, and that is, a, that is another, I mean, that's one reason why modeling dwarfs is hard, because you, you have to suppress feedback enough in, so that they don't, you know, they don't form like 0.1% of their baryons and stars, but you can't blow all their gas away because they all form stars late unless they're a satellite. So yeah, that's, that's a problem with dwarfs. <laughs> Or in pi interaction for some break. 
Yeah. But typically, what they find is that their luminosity function are very thin, like it's usually flatter than yeah. gauge by extrapolation. I mean, minus yeah. 1.5 or so. Right. But even if it goes uh, to extremely faint line, you're not adding a lot of light. Uh, yes. Right. So if the, that's right. Right. So if that's the case, and I would say I think that the reason why, I mean, I think that what they did was very interesting. And weren't you? I thought you did that too. Maybe that you were on a different paper, but the okay, um, the the work that Dan did, Dan and Charlie and others did, I thought was really interesting. But I think the only the only issue with it was is that it, they weren't really tied that closely to what the in body simulations were doing globally. And so I think it's hard to know exactly how to interpret their slopes. But it's certainly true that faint end slopes, um, if, if the luminosity functions just aren't as steep as what the, current, you know, the direct counts are suggesting they are, then this whole thing goes away and the thing is just flatter and we don't have to worry about it. Nicola. Yeah, I have a simple question maybe. Um, so you need about a 200, 10 to the 5 um, smaller galaxies. But what about the globular clusters, which are 10 to the 6? If globular clusters contribute to reionization in a significant way, that would be perfect. That would be fine, and that would actually work pretty well. But we can't associate them with dark matter halos. I mean, I guess, I mean, the conventional wisdom is dark. We don't associate globular clusters with dark matter halos for different reasons. And so we're not, they sort of are not part of this discussion, other than if the globular clusters were contributing to reionization, then it would alleviate this problem. And the numbers do work out reasonably well. And this seems like a really nice picture you're painting, and, and for what it's worth, I kind of agree from our simulations, it would be unlikely the baryons would get rid of this tension. Um, but I just wonder, uh, do, we, do we understand the completeness of the local group sample well enough to, to be able to make these kind of statements at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it, it is an issue. I mean, I, we focused on this kind of 10 to the 5 number because you only need 100 million years of star formation to get 10 to the 5 solar masses. <coughs> If you give me a little bit more star formation, then I think we are reasonably complete, probably out to sort of 10 to the 6 throughout pretty deep volumes. How, how deep we go to 10 to the 5 throughout the local group, you know, I don't think we know. And I wouldn't be shocked if there were several more of those things out there. Thank you. I got a little lost. Um, so could you just repeat whether or not you think these objects are useful for reionization or not? Oh, I... Um, I'm well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't think, I guess let me just be clear about what I do think. Um, you know, there is, this, there is this picture, which I think is reasonably compelling and very interesting, that if you extrapolate the luminosity functions down to this point, you have enough ionizing photons for, to keep things going. I don't think that's possible. I think these things have to truncate somewhere around here, or else you're going to get into trouble in the local group. Now, what's actually producing the ionizing photons, whether it's just that the escape fractions are a lot higher and you can still do it with galaxies, or whether we need QSOs, I'm sort of agnostic on that. And yeah. furthermore, I guess if we took seriously the broad PDF that Martin was talking about, I don't think these galaxies would help to solve that problem either. Do you agree? No, I don't think, no, I don't think so. Oh, really? Oh. Somehow you can do it. You can do both. You sort of you've, you skate that line and you get it. Huh. Huh. Cool. Okay. Okay. I'll look for that. Thank you. Okay. 
Yeah, right. But that's, you know, with so Richard, the, they, you do have to go all the way down to the by Richard six and a half. Yeah, so. right. But that's where, isn't that, you know, you assume, and we did too, just given mm -hmm. the data, that six and a half, six was where you were fully ironed. Okay. Okay.